Good morning and welcome to College Church Online. My name is Rahel and we're just about to jump into the service in a few minutes. Church, thank you so much for inviting us into your home today. We're just so grateful that we can meet together as a church community virtually. I believe that God can use this platform to do great work in our lives. Now, if you've joined us, feel free to say hello in the live chat or make a comment to let us know that you're with us. If this is your first time, click on the first time guest link and fill it out and a member of our First Impressions team will reach out and send you a gift as our way of saying welcome. Anyway, hey, I know today is just going to bless you. It's our heart here at College Church to lead people to encounter a new life in Jesus. And I believe that that can happen right where we are. So let's open up our hearts, lean in and let's get ready for the Word of God. Now, if you're watching this on Facebook, can you please do me a solid? Feel free to share this stream. The more people that share this, the more people that we can reach with our service. Isn't that amazing? We don't have to be specialist evangelists anymore to spread the good news of Jesus. We can simply share this stream or share any content that points to Jesus to spread the good news. These are the times we live in now. With all that being said, we're going to begin in a few minutes.
morning. My name is Rahel, and on behalf of me and the whole College Church team, we just want to say welcome. Today, we're going to worship our God together through music, through prayer, through giving, and through a word delivered by Pastor Wayne Krauss. The coronavirus has provided us with challenges that we were not prepared for. It has challenged us on how we do church and how we Sabbath in the present. So where to from here? Back as we were or forge a new way forward? Do we remain in the familiar or do we build upon the lessons we have learned during COVID? Should we be stuck in the moment or make this moment matter? The church seems to be heading into a new normal, or is it? What do you say? Where do you see the church heading post-COVID? I'm so excited because today we have Dr. Wayne Krause from the South Pacific Division bringing us the word. And I'm confident that God's message through Wayne will captivate, inspire, and challenge us today. Now, I want to talk about a new way of inviting people to church. We spoke about it the last few weeks, and it's called a watch party. As this service is streaming right now, if you are watching this service on Facebook, you can simply share this stream so it reaches more people. And now there's a button marked with a popcorn. Now, if you click that button, it allows you to invite your friends or family to watch this service together. Hosting watch parties is helpful for us to build community with the people we do life with and those that we're trying to lead to Jesus. In your watch party, in the chat section, you can discuss the service with each other. Only those you invite can see your chat section. After the service, you can continue the conversation via the chat feature. Now, when you end your watch party, people can see who attended your party, but all the comments made during this party will disappear. But we'll guide you more on the weeks to come on how you can invite your friends and your family to College Church Online. Hey, something cool in Psalms 95 chapter 1 says, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation, that is Jesus. So wherever you've joined us from, join us as we worship our God. Good morning, College Church family. We want to welcome you to church this morning. Fun fact, this is actually the first Sabbath of August. So crazy that we're already more than halfway through the year, but we want to come and invite you to sing and worship with us. So let's sing. Hey! 
sing, I raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than.
Hey church, something that we learn during our worship is that it's an incredible privilege, not a religious duty. Thank you worship team for your service to others each week. Right now, I just have a few announcements for you. For the last few weeks, we've been talking about a survey and 136 of you have completed it. Thank you so much to those who did. Now, if you're interested in seeing the results of that survey, you can go to collegechurch.info and click on the orange tab entitled Latest News and you'll find it on there. At the present time, the pastoral team, as well as the leadership team, are determining what the next step in this process is. So stay tuned in the weeks to come for more on this. You may not believe this, but our pastors on one of their visitations were asked to set up a TV for one of our senior members. And without a TV manual, armed with only their service, our pastors set up this TV to Wi-Fi and got it working. Now, the church member asked them to do this so they could tune into College Church Online. How cool is that? They don't only visit you, they can set things up. So if you're in need of things to be done at your place, like landscaping or a room extension, or maybe you'd like a deck built, don't call our pastors. Someone like Jim Hawkins is probably a better contact for you. But if you are in need of a visitation, whether in person or virtually, or maybe they can help you with setting up your TV because they've proven themselves in that regard, please contact us at collegechurch.info. Now, church, we also want you to know that the sleeping bags have been purchased and we await their delivery. When we receive them, our pastors will deliver the sleeping bags to South Lakes Marketplace to distribute them to the homeless. To everyone who supported this initiative, thank you so much for your generosity. For our next announcement, we're going to hear from our pastors. Good morning, College Church. As you may be aware, since COVID, we've released two surveys and held two Zoom discussions to try and ascertain what our church members and attendees have learned from Sabbathing Different since March and how that can impact how we Sabbath moving forward post-COVID. Now, something that we've discovered from many of your responses that was throughout this time, many of you have felt quite isolated and lonely, lacking community. You felt that moving forward, we need to place a larger emphasis on building community as a church and creating more opportunities for community to happen. Not community as in sitting in pews, singing songs together and listening to a sermon, but community as in sitting together in circles and doing life with other people. Michaela. Thanks, Al. This brings us to our new seven series, Circles. Now, sitting in rows in church has its purpose, but for a deeper intimacy with God and those you do life with, sitting in circles are better. You can create a circle anywhere. You can create a circle in your home, out on a bushwalk, cycling, taking photos, on a picnic, in a cafe, or maybe even crocheting. Just in your network of relationships, create a circle. Now, during this series, we will journey through the parables of Jesus. Accompanying each presentation will be a set of questions that you can use to discuss in your circles. These questions are only a guide if you need them. You don't have to use them. You may choose your own questions and use those if you want or simply chat through these things in your circles. And kids, don't worry. There will be questions for you too that you can chat through with your mums and dads at any time. Over to you, Nim. Thank you, Michaela. So let's not waste a crisis. It is our hope that you will grow closer to God and closer with each other through this series. So in your network of relationships, I encourage you to create a circle. Dive into the Word of God together and know that you are making disciples with the power and the presence of Jesus. Hey church, how amazing does this new sermon series sound? I'm so excited to see what it has in store for us. Right now, I'm going to speak into our offering for today. Each week, we collect an offering that goes towards a specific cause. This week's cause is Feed the House. Feed the House goes directly to our church budget here at College Church. In these ever-changing times, we are using our budget to help those who are doing it tough in our local community, those on our college campus, and our members. 
Our budget also supports what we do every Saturday with Beginners with Steph at 9.30 a.m., the link with Cal and Mickey at 10 a.m., and then our main service, which is currently streaming. So to give to this week's offering, you can head on over to egiving.org.au, select Avondale College Church, and there you can give to this week's offering and you can return tithe. To everyone who is supporting us with your finances during this time, thank you so much for your generosity and your faithfulness. With all this being said, it's now come time for us to pray over all that we're doing. Good morning, College Church. I hope you're having an amazing morning. My name is Jaden. And my name is Hayley. And this morning we have the privilege of being able to share the prayer with you. So let's close our eyes. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for this opportunity that we get to come together on your Sabbath morning. Um, we pray for all of those families who are able to be together at this time and for our friends who are far apart as well. We just pray that we are able to experience you this morning through the word that's shared and the music that's shared too. We thank you so much for the week that you've brought us through. And I want to pray especially now for the college students, those who are coming back to dorms and traveling and those who are on pracs and different things like that. We just pray that you are especially close to those students at this time, that they may feel your peace and encouragement on this journey. I also pray for our school students who have gone back to school. I hope that it's been a smooth transition and for all the families too, um, with whatever work and things that may be. We thank you for our community that we have here at College Church and for the opportunity that we have to share life together and to share church together. Please be with us each as we go into this next week too. In your name, amen. Father God, I want to thank you for the community that College Church has. I want to thank you for how uh, welcoming and open and warm that they are um, in supporting the college students. I know it makes a big difference in our lives. Lord, I want to thank you for this last week. Thank you for the rain. Thank you for the sunshine. Uh, and just thank you for um, giving us the safe passage through. Lord, I want to pray for those who are in leadership positions throughout the country, whether that be um, federally, state level of our church, of businesses, whatever it may be, Lord. The leaders in our country at this time are under a lot of pressure to have to make some really big decisions at the moment. And so I just pray that you guide them through those decisions, help them to make the decisions that keep us the most safe, but also help us to be connected during this time. Lord, I want to pray especially for small business owners. Um, this, this time, the last few months, has really knocked everyone around, but especially businesses. So I just pray that you're with them and you help them. Lord, I want to pray for those who are affected directly by the virus. Um, please be with them, help them. Um, especially those in Victoria at the moment, they're going through a really rough time. I just pray that you help them realize that you are near and that you love them and that you care for them. I pray that uh, the government here in New South Wales gets everything under control, that nothing worse ha uh, happens. I pray for those who um, have been locked out of, of their home due to borders being closed. And I just pray that those sort of situations get sorted out soon. Lord, finally, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for your grace. I want to thank you for your love. And I want to thank you for your mercy. I want to thank you for dying on the cross for us, Lord. The sacrifice that you gave us is unparalleled. And I just pray that um, as we go into this next section of our service, that we're just able to um, be able to understand the gravity of what your actions were when you gave your life for us. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to choose you and have eternal life. Mm. So, Lord, from here, I just pray that we're able to concentrate on the message, reflect on who you are, and learn more about you. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for all that you continue to do in our lives today. I pray this all in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Church family, we're going to ask you to stand again um, wherever you are in your homes, wherever you may be, please stand. Let's continue to worship our amazing God. Let's sing. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. ever breathe we live for you oh. 
It has been said that we should never waste a crisis. As the Seventh-day Adventist Church around the world moves slowly through and out of, hopefully, this pandemic, what do we need to do to not waste this crisis? What lessons can we learn that will help us be a healthier church and one that is more focused on mission and being a disciple-making movement throughout the South Pacific? Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? My Father, I want to thank you for the privilege of being able to share and to talk about your church and the way forward. And I ask that the words I say may be acceptable unto you. And as we worship, as we open your word, we thank you for the Holy Spirit. Amen. Most of my ministry, most of my working life has been spent in trying to see the church be the church that God really wants it to be. I have a passion for seeing people who are far from God, see the lights come on, see them accept the amazing grace that Jesus Christ has in their lives and become lifelong disciples. It's an amazing thing. Where I work now, I work for the headquarters of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the South Pacific, and my specific emphasis that I'm involved in is how do we reach the cities with the gospel of Jesus Christ? I'm part of the discipleship team down there. So the idea of making disciples, multiplying disciples, becoming a disciple-making movement is central to who I am. There is no doubt that we have received a wake-up call on how we do church and how, as a people, we are church. Some people can hardly wait to get back to their church buildings, to catch up with friends, to worship, to feel part of a larger community. For others, being in isolation has been a revelation. They've loved it. Relaxing at home, watching online, sermons, discussing things, and having a relaxing lunch and spend the rest of the day with family and friends. In my presentation today, I want to outline some options for those who are thinking of being church and what church might look like for them into the future. I want to outline some options for those looking at using college church as their home. I'm a member of this church. Never waste a crisis. The new normal is going to be interesting. But is the new normal really that new? When we look back at the early Christian church, our early Christian history, the new normal looks surprisingly like the old normal. In the New Testament, we see the early Christian church worshipping in various different environments, taking advantage of their normal, the crises that they worked through. They worshipped in the large temple in Jerusalem that could have thousands of people there. They worshipped in houses, synagogues, by a river. It seems that early Christians in the Roman era also worshipped in courtyards. That's where the pagan guilds met. These guilds were made up of um, artisans who may be woodworkers or builders or bricklayers or what have you, and they had very exclusive guilds. And they met in courtyards. The Christians came along. And they were not exclusive. They were inclusive. They invited women, children, and slaves to be part of their communal meals, and they invited anyone else to be part of it as well. The early Christians took advantage of their normal and as they faced a different crises, they used whatever piece or place of worship they could to be together. As Adventists in our crisis, what could the new or old normal look like for us? Where should we worship in our new normal? If we were to follow the example of the old normal, then we could worship anywhere and in any type of facility that would aid in mission and being a disciple-making movement. We know that in Scripture, the word church never refers to a building. If our specific culture centres church around a building, that's okay, but just realise that's a cultural thing. It's not biblical. In Scripture, the word for church is ecclesia, and it usually refers to a gathering of people for a purpose. In Acts 19.38, the
The crowd who want to harm Paul are told to have it solved at the regular ecclesia or the regular gathering where they would meet for that purpose. Paul takes the pagan word for assembly and uses it to describe the Christians gathering together for a purpose. And this purpose he calls church. So in the new normal, as in the old normal, whether you worship in a designated building or not is not the issue. If a building helps with creating a disciple-making movement, then it is useful. If it doesn't, then we shouldn't use it. I'm very wary of groups of people who just want to stay home because it's convenient in this new normal, in this crisis. There is a huge danger of just becoming a consumeristic group, just looking out for themselves. We know that families that whenever, without the um, the new normal, when things were kind of normal, whenever there was a good weekend where the weather was fine, they would take their family away camping or what have you, and then couldn't understand when their children went off to university, why they also didn't want to become part of church because when a good weekend came around, they just went off by themselves. They had no desire to be part of church. We've got to make sure that in this new normal, our experiences of home doesn't result in the same thing. But there are a number of options going forward. Media can be a huge advantage. And in all these options that I'm going to give... Media is involved or can be involved. Option one is to go back to the building we've been worshipping in and act as if nothing has happened. That, to me, is the worst option possible. That is not taking advantage of the crisis. At least if we go back to our building and worship together, ask the question, are we making disciples in this building? Option two is house churches associated with a larger established church, like college. These are small groups of people gathering together in homes by a river, etc., who are being church while utilising the resources and accountability from a larger established church. We're going to see a lot more of that. Third option is a cluster of house churches that kind of network together, sharing resources and accountability. They are also what I believe the future is going to see a lot more of. Four, stand-alone house churches. Most of the churches in the New Testament were house churches. And each of those houses together were considered a church. And they are a church if they're making disciples. As I said, the use of media has many options and is very advantageous. But they are tools. They do not actually be, they are not actually making us church. What is the importance of church? When I was growing up, I had very mixed feelings about the church. As many of you have experienced, you saw the clickiness, you saw some nasty things happen in church. And there was a time in my life when I felt that I wanted to give up on church. The trouble I had was I believed in God. I believed he actually loved me. I actually believed he wanted to make a difference in my life. And when I gave my life to him after what he had done for me, I started looking at this idea of church and what God thinks of the church. And here are some texts that talk about the importance of church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it, Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18. Christ purchased the church with his own blood, Acts 20, 28. All things have been put under Christ's feet, and he is head over all things to the church. The church is Christ's body and is his fullness, Ephesians 1, 22, 23. It is through the church that God's manifold wisdom is made known, Ephesians 3, 10. Christ is the head of the church, Ephesians 5, 23. Christ loves the church, Ephesians 5.25. The church is his bride, Revelation 19.7. Simply put, the church is very important to Christ and we need to be very careful how we regard and we treat it. C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity makes this point about the church and it forms the basis for what I want to talk to you about 
now. He says, The church exists for nothing else but to draw men, women into Christ, to make them little Christs. Note that. The purpose of the church is to make people into little Christs. If they're not doing that, All the cathedrals, clergy, missions, sermons, even the Bible itself are simply a waste of time. God became man for no other purpose. Very important. Last week, Pastor Michaela, great sermon. You need to go back and watch it if you haven't. Talked about how disciples of Jesus Christ were to be known for their love for one another. When we talk about how a person grows as a disciple... We are thinking of the separate but linked environments. There's the individual who needs to take responsibility of their growth. There's the family unit. And there's also the church that gathers together for a purpose. And within this loving environment, this community, that real discipleship happens. In these loving communities, there are at least five areas, five activities, five experiences that need to happen for something to be a church. Now, the reality is, wherever you go, you are church. Wherever you go, you are the body of Christ. You are Christ's representative. But when we are gathered together, there are five activities. And when you're thinking about the future and where you want to be, if you want to be part of a house church or what have you, you may not feel comfortable coming back to an established building. Here are the five characteristics you need to be asking yourself. Are these happening within our community? Jesus, in Matthew chapter 22 is asked the question what the greatest commandment is. Now, the, dis- the followers, uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were trying to trick Jesus. And Jesus just quoted from the Old Testament. But if you have a look in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 22, and I'm look- reading here from verse 36, Jesus is asked, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he, that's Jesus, said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is a summary of the first four of the Ten Commandments. And this, I would say, is the first activity, the first experience, the first thing that you need to grow in if you want to be church, and it's worship. Loving God is worship. We could say that the worship of Saviour and Creator is core to Adventism. This is especially important in these last days as we proclaim the three angels' messages. The gospel we teach in our groups determines the disciples we make. True gospel teaching will always result in worship. Worship is simply our individual or collective responses to God's initiating grace in our lives. God acts, we respond, always in that order. We believe that we exist to worship God in our lives and our church. Worship isn't primarily about us. Worship is absolutely about God. Worship helps us to concentrate on God as the first priority in our lives and relationships. In worship, the whole person is involved, body, mind and spirit. And different worship styles will meet the needs of different people. There's no one right style. We worship God because he created us and then by his grace he saved us, is now living in us and through us and very soon he's going to be returning for us. Worship as individuals and in our gatherings should be inspiring. The spiritual practices people use to do this individually, in families and in church, include Bible study with the purpose of knowing and loving God, prayer, solitude, singing, praising, fasting, etc. A disciple will also engage in these spiritual practices in their families. So as you gather together, is worship happening? And are you growing in your worship, in your family and individually? The next verse that we, will read, that we read, when Jesus says, this is the first and great commandment, verse 39, he says, the second greatest commandment 
is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. The second core experience that needs to happen within groups that want to be church is ministry or service. This commandment is a call to serve or to minister to others. Every disciple, every disciple is a minister gifted by God for the benefit of his body and the community. Jesus explains what a neighbour is when he tells the story of the Good Samaritan. He talks about someone who's an outcast but is also a neighbour. He indicates that our ministry to others involves a passion for justice and mercy to all, regardless of their ethnicity, gender, religion, sexuality or social status. Because of the Adventist belief in the loving our neighbours and because we believe that every person is created in the image of God, we have as a church organisation developed an amazing education, health and organisations such as ADRA. They do your great things. I'm so proud in this pandemic how the church has been able to send thousands of dollars across to our island fields where their economy has fallen apart and unemployment is rife. And we've been able to do that because as a church we believe in helping others. However, that's an organisational thing. Individually, we're also supposed to love our neighbour. We're also <clears throat> realise that one of the great responsibilities of a church is to help disciples discover, implement and develop their spiritual gifts and minister in the areas that God intends. This is also the individual's responsibility and it's often discovered first in families. So, as you gather for what you want to be church, is ministry happening? And are you growing as ministers? So that's two. Worship, ministry, service. They need to be happening for some, a group of people together gathering for a purpose in this crisis to be church. I would like to point out another three quickly. Each of these points could be a presentation or multiple pleasant presentations in itself. In Matthew 28, we have what is called the Gospel Commission. This is the command that Jesus gave after he was resurrected and just before he went to heaven. And he gave a command to all his followers, that's to you and me. So if you turn to Matthew chapter 28, here's Jesus talking to quite a number of people on a mountain. Matthew 28, 16 to 20. I'd like to read the first part. And just says this in verse 19. Go and make disciples of all nations. I'd say that this, we could say this is witness or evangelism. Number three. The sentence could be read, as you are going, make disciples. As we are going about one, our day-to-day -day lives as gardeners, homemakers, teachers, students, etc., we're to make disciples. We are disciples first... While our careers and our jobs are the arena that we make disciples, the salvation of individuals is a life and death matter. It's something I'm passionate about. It, to see the lights go on in someone's life when they realise how much Jesus Christ loves them is amazing. We must look at people through God's eyes, through Christ's eyes, and be used by him to have individuals become Christians. Followers of Jesus, disciples. Followers of Jesus. Christ and, and every gathering of people who are church need to make sure that there's at least one person there who is not a follower of Jesus Christ, who's just looking. If it's just a group of Christians gathering together and we're church, that becomes inclusive very quickly. You can become a, a ministry, you can be a group, you can be what have you, you can be a cult. But unless there's witness going on, unless we're actually sharing with others what Jesus Christ has done with our lives, unless there's someone there that we're sharing with, we're just talking to ourselves. Witnessing is something that every disciple is called to do. We are not, may not be an evangelist, but the idea of witnessing about what Jesus has done in your life, in my life, the first thing we do when we're witnessing is learn how to listen. We're not good at that. Listen to another person's story. Spend a lot of time listening to another person's story. And only then do we see how our story fits with their story. 
And then we can talk about how God's story fits with their story and our story. So, disciples are to take responsibility for growing in witness in these groups that we call church. The fourth point, that if you want to grow as a disciple, if you want to be church, this activity, this experience must happen, is this verse. Baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. When a disciple is baptised, they're baptised into Christ as a public declaration of what has already happened in their lives, the reality of salvation and their commitment to follow Christ in discipleship. When a disciple is baptised, they are also baptised into the church, also as a public declaration of what has already happened in their lives. The reality of being part of the community and saying we want this community to be involved in our discipleship. Baptism is the public declaration that the disciple wants that community and the community makes the same declaration that we will be involved in helping you grow as a disciple. So the fourth one is community. It's to be known by how they love each other, John 13, 35, that Pastor Michaela talked about last week. Disciples grow best within community. Within such a community, we have the privilege of being able to share to others the same love, acceptance and forgiveness Christ shows to us, no matter who they are or what their circumstances. Christ shows us, no matter who they are, that they are loved by him. Within such a community, all the other aspects of disciple-making happen best, Worship, ministry, witness, and Christ-likeness we'll talk about in a minute. Such a community is the optimal environment because it gives accountability and it gives support and it gives encouragement. We praise God for all Christians that believe and accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are our brothers and sisters in the Lord. Adventists are proud to be part of this worldwide community Our specific Adventist identity and unity comes first through the gospel and secondly through our mission of making disciples in the context of the three angels' messages. All our beliefs and practices that clarify our identity must come from the gospel and our mission. Being part of the Adventist community assumes that one of the purposes for gathering together as a group is to grow in our understanding of Adventist identity and mission. If you don't want to be an Adventist church, that's your privilege and, yeah, that's your option. But if you do want to be part of the Adventist church, what is happening in your gathering to help you grow in your Adventist identity and mission? The great gospel commission that we've just been reading about goes on to say, teaching them to observe everything that I've commanded you. And this is the fifth aspect that needs to be happening with any group that wants to call itself church. Christ-likeness. The desire because of Christ and because of what he has done for us to become more like him in every way and join with him in his mission is normal for discipleship, disciples. Reflecting Christ's character should be the overriding passion of Christians. As C.S. Lewis says, to make us into little Christ. This includes those practices that we've talked about, worship. It includes ministry. It includes witness. It includes being part of community. It's asking and desiring God to turn us into more and more like him. The Adventist church has a clear purpose. When it gathers, it has to be because of the purpose to which it has been called. In these last days of Earth's history, in this new normal, taking advantage of this crisis we're in, we have an amazing opportunity to re-look at church, what it means to be church, and to then become a movement that transforms the Pacific. What have we learned so far? We should not waste this or any crisis. We have an amazing opportunity to re-evaluate what church means. We have noticed that the new normal could be surprisingly like the old normal. We are to gather in any place we can that will advance disciple making and mission. 
We constantly have to ask, are we gathered together for the purpose God intends for his people that he calls church? Our worship, ministry, witness, community, Christ-likeness happening. So, the big idea. To be a disciple-making movement transforming the Pacific, we need to gather together with a purpose. And I pray that that is your experience right now and as we move into our new normal, taking advantage of this crisis. Would you bow your heads with me? Father in heaven, I want to thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ who came to this earth and looked at us and said, "Ah, oh, you're my body. Looked at us and said, I want you to gather together for a purpose. Who died for us and rose for us, is living in us and through us and soon will return for us. May we be the church, multiplying disciples and becoming a movement once again is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, church, the question remains, are we heading towards a new normal or the old normal? I said at the beginning of our service that I am confident that God's message through Wayne will captivate, inspire and challenge us today. And boy, did it live up to it. Church, we should never waste a crisis. We have an amazing opportunity given by God to re-evaluate what being a church means. We learned today that we can gather in any place that will make an advance in discipleship making and mission. So thank you so much for joining us here today and we look forward to have you join us again. As we close, something we say at the end of every church service is this. As you go into your mission field, which is your network of relationships, know that you are making disciples with the presence and the power of Jesus. In your network of relationships, go and act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. And don't forget to be kind. See you next week.